Okay, good morning. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Thank you for joining us for a critical discussion today on the continued threat of ISIS and the role that disengagement and reconciliation need to play in its lasting defeat. As many of you know, the U.S.-led coalition to defeat ISIS, along with the Syrian Defense Forces, regained all the territory that was occupied by ISIS in Iraq and Syria in March of last year. Though that territorial defeat was significant, serious challenges remain. Thousands of foreign fighters from more than 120 countries travel to Iraq and Syria to join ISIS in their brutal reign of terror. Today, many of these fighters and their families remain in displacement camps and detention centers throughout the region. One of these camps, Al Ho, presents one of the world's toughest both security and humanitarian challenges. Located in northeast Syria, El Hol houses more than 65,000 people who may or may not be affiliated with ISIS, including about 10,000 foreigners from more than 50 countries. 98% of El Hol residents are women and children. They live in horrible conditions. They often lack food, clean water, and many of them fall victim to violence within the camp. Not only does Al Hol present a humanitarian crisis, especially now with the presence of COVID-19, but national security experts fear that it's a breeding ground for more violent extremism. Last May, USIP formed a working group to help the US government and the international community better respond to these intersecting security and humanitarian challenges. We facilitated dialogues between humanitarian actors and U.S. interagency partners from the Department of Defense, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the Department of State. The goal is to develop recommendations on how to respond to the challenges of El Hol. One key recommendation highlighted the urgent need to safely and effectively coordinate the voluntary resettlement and repatriation of the tens of thousands of women and children that are in El Hol because of the volatile security situation in Northeast Syria. This will only be possible if we enable those affiliated with ISIS to disengage from violent extremism and at the same time foster community reconciliation in the areas where they will be returning. So disengagement and re reconciliation are the primary focus of USIP's violent extremism program. This is a peace building approach. Uh, it focuses on transforming relationships, on building social bonds, on generating a sense of belonging and providing justice and accountability. This is based on growing research and experience that military solutions alone will not solve the problems of violent extremism. We have a distinguished set of panelists today to discuss these issues, unpack these concepts. They will be moderated by USIP's Director of Violent Extremism, Leanne Erdberg Stedman. And after the panel discussion, I'll join General Kenneth McKenzie, the Commander for US Central Command, for a conversation on the current stabilization priorities in Iraq and Syria. The coalition's key areas of focus moving forward and how the military sees the challenges of repatriation and rehabilitation of thousands of people over the long term. We welcome the audience to submit your questions throughout the live, and you can use the live chat function. As a reminder, please keep your questions concise uh, and we'll focus on today's topic of ISIS and the associated humanitarian issues, and please use a question form. We Hope to get to everybody's question, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. And in the meantime, please engage with us on Twitter with the hashtag reintegrating extremists. Let me now turn it over to Leanne to introduce our panelists and start the discussion. Thank you for joining us this morning. Leanne. 
Thank you so much, Nancy. And thanks for your amazing tenure at USIP. We're so grateful for your leadership. And I know I joined many of my colleagues and our friends at USIP who are gonna miss you dearly as you depart the Institute this month. To begin, I'm gonna share the rules of the road for the first part of our panel discussion. I'm gonna introduce our esteemed panelists. Then I'm gonna give about five minutes of framing remarks on the topic as USIP has been researching it. And then I'm gonna jump into a moderated discussion with the panelists. After around 30 minutes or so of us asking questions and discussing amongst one another, we're gonna to turn to audience submitted questions around 1040 or so. Um, as Nancy said, you can submit those questions on the chat function. And as a reminder, please keep those questions focused on today's topic of Iraq, Syria, ISIS, and the associated humanitarian and reconciliation issues. It is my pleasure today to introduce to the incredible and esteemed panelists Analysts. First, we have Ambassador Bill Roebuck, who's the Deputy Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS and a Senior Advisor to the Special Representative for Syria Engagement. He's going to provide us with insights into the current state of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS and what are the priorities moving forward. Next, we have Philippa Candler, who is the Acting UN High Commissioner for Refugees Representative for Iraq, and she's going to provide remarks on UNHCR work in Iraq particularly when it comes to the displaced. Next, we have Major General Alexis Grinkowicz, who's the Director of Operations at U.S. Central Command, and he's going to provide an overview of current U.S. CENTCOM operations, strategic objectives, and how they relate to today's topic. And next, we have Azadeh Moveni, who's the Project Director at for Gender at the International Crisis Group and the author of the incredible book, Guest House for Young Widows, that looks into the lives of 13 young women who joined ISIS. And she's going to provide us with insights on life inside the al Holt camp and how understanding what made people join ISIS and what it was like living under ISIS might assist with us in today's topic. It's my pleasure to welcome all four of them today, and we're going to dig into their specific work and expertise shortly. But first, as I promised, a few framing remarks as USIP sees violent extremist disengagement and reconciliation, or what we're calling Vader. We're committed to pr proving here at USIP that it's practical and it takes action. But as Nancy laid out for us, this is not going to be straightforward. While many should and will face trial and incarceration, the criminal justice sector is not going to solve this challenge on its own. And in places like Al Hol, where there are undeniable perpetrators of violence and we see them continue to try and enforce the caliphate's austere violent norms upon others, those are not the only residents there. There are those visible adherents, but there's also those who are bystanders. There are the repentant, and there's also victims of ISIS atrocities. Perhaps most confoundingly, there are those who are a perpetrator and victim in the same person, who are at once traumatized and in need of support, but also accountable for engaging with a genocidal group. These varying roles and levels of devotion to ISIS are neither well understood, nor are they static. And this is not to mention the many, many children who are victims of brutal circumstance. They've been caught up in the aftermath of this crisis, not knowing a childhood, many highly traumatized and developmentally stunted. So communities are gonna to need to be prepared for these returning persons of all shapes and stripes and to rehabilitate and reintegrate those effectively and inclusively. Our work on this topic builds on the great work of researchers and scholars and local experts because we've learned that people can abandon their violent attitudes and violent behaviors, and communities can work towards social cohesion to avoid further violence. Decades of research from psychology and sociology, and criminology, underscored that people abandon violent roles and people adopt new identities. But this has to include more than just a person changing their mind. It has to also include interactions between those disengaging and community members. And in conflict settings, where we have victims and bystanders and adherents who have all experienced destruction and some have resulting trauma, the key to enabling a future that's not solely defined by the past is going to require focusing on the humanity of individuals and their capacity for change and their well-being. 
So to help guide our conversation, we've started to come up with a framework of what we're calling Vader. And they're further researched and presented in USIP reports and publications that are available on our website. But a couple quick pillars to help guide today's conversation. The first is that we're making a plea to de-exceptionalize violent extremism because it's not the only discipline that works with the highly violent. Instead, we can incorporate lessons from cults and gangs and militias and organized crime and other challenges. Like we've seen in places like Colombia, peace building has shown that offering a new group and a new identity and a new future to the disengaged can make all the difference. The second pillar is that behavior change is key because people engage in violent groups and leave violent ideologies for a variety of reasons. So by centering on behavioral change, we can see results that just changing somebody's beliefs could never accomplish. Additionally, behavioral health and psychosocial support can address barriers to why people change. Barriers like trauma and hopelessness and fear, loss, grief, shame, and humiliation. The third pillar is that reducing stigma is possible. We often hear words like jihadi and ISIS bride and terrorists, but these merely reinforce the very identity that people are trying to disengage from. And it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Instead, we should use language to our benefit because people tend to conform to the labels that society gives them. So even calling a person rehabilitated can itself play a significant role. The fourth pillar is to facilitate justice and accountability. When it comes to communities, many may gravitate toward revenge, but transitional and restorative justice can also be an option to temper vengeance and also redistribute power. And as we saw in places like Rwanda, community-based redemption rituals can help perpetrators acknowledge their harm and accept responsibility for crimes committed while helping to restore the dignity to victims and heal communities. And lastly, Resilience is possible even in the most dire post-conflict circumstances. Disengagement and reconciliation from violent extremism should be a part of stabilization in order to break the long-term cycles of violence and conflict that have plagued too many countries around the world. Alongside stabilization activities like rubble removal and training for new government leaders, a new playbook must also leave room for Vader. We're working hard to put these principles into practice in the countries and places that have the greatest needs. This is all part of a peace building approach that flips the script. Rather than focusing on risk alone, we consider what resilience factors exist in individuals and in communities and what can be strengthened to prevent the resurgence of violence and enable lasting peace. We hope that today this conversation will help forge pathways ahead for our efforts and for the many efforts that are ongoing throughout the international community. And we're looking forward to the unique vantage points and expertise of our esteemed panelists. So with that, I'd like to first turn to Ambassador Roba and say, can you tell us a little bit more about your assessment of the current state of the Defeat ISIS campaign? What are your primary objectives today? And what are some of the principal setbacks as you see them to continued success? Thank you, Leanne. And thank you for the opportunity to address this uh, distinguished panel. Um, I'm very grateful to USIP for putting this together. It should be an interesting uh, discussion. Um, let me start with the Global Coalition. Um, I think that's the place to start as we talk about the state of ISIS. Um, the Global Coalition is made up of 82 members and organizations, uh, mostly states, but a few organizations like the EU, uh, NATO, uh, and Interpol are also uh, members. Um, the, the coalition has been incredibly important in the fight against ISIS. It has been a fluid uh, diplomatic instrument um, that has allowed um, the international community to, um, to use, I would call it, uh, coercive economic and uh, diplomatic pressure, um, and also to coordinate with the uh, military forces in the fight, the military fight against ISIS. Um, the coalition is united. Uh, the members uh, strongly believe in what they're doing. 
uh, and believe that the threat against ISIS remains and that they need to uh, be uh, involved in the ongoing uh, campaign against ISIS. Um, in terms of the military campaign, uh, as uh, Nancy said, uh, the military part of it is largely over. Um, ISIS no longer holds territory. Um, they are, um, their leadership has been decimated uh, and scattered. Um, in Syria, for example, in northeastern Syria, they don't have safe haven uh, largely. Um, they're under significant CT pressure uh, from the, our partner force, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, the, the, uh, in addition to the military campaign, which has been um, so important in um, um, defeating ISIS uh, as a physical caliphate, uh, the coalition has been involved in a, a number of other lines of effort, and these are not uh, just military. Um, they involve things like um, choking off their finances, um, using international organizations like the Mina Fatif. Um, of course, um, um, our uh, Treasury Department, but also counterpart uh, ministries of uh, finance and economy that uh, cooperate with us on this uh, choking off the flow of uh, finances, and it's been largely successful. ISIS struggles with it with its um, to finance its operations now. Um, a similar line of effort is involved with uh, choking off uh, foreign fighters. Um, at the front end, this involved um, uh, choking uh, fighters uh, trying to flow into Syria and Iraq, and now is involved in trying to prevent them from from leaving and going to safe havens in other parts of the world. Um, the coalition is also involved in countering the uh, violent narrative or the messaging of Iraq. Um, we have uh, messaging centers in a number of capitals that cooperate in trying to uh, counter ISIS's message on social media and on other media. Excuse me. And um, the last uh, line of effort that the coalition is involved in is uh, 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 mounting stabilization assistance to the uh, communities that have returned uh, or been liberated from, um, from ISIS. Um, so it's a big agenda, um, but um, it's been remarkably successful. Um, it's been, I think, in, the, in, in recent history, it's been one of the most uh, successful international uh, ventures that you could uh, look at because of the level of cooperation and the complexity of the task that was involved. Um, regarding the task, um, let me just say a word about um, how we assess ISIS and the threat that it poses. Um, ISIS remains a signif significant threat, um, and that's why uh, the military presence is still there, and that's why the coalition remains engaged to um, prevent ISIS from um, resurging. Our assessment is that it is a threat, but it isn't an increasing threat. Um, it has um, some capabilities, but far weaker than what it used to have. Uh, it's not able to, um, to, uh, to, the, to the significant degree, it's not able to mount uh, sophisticated uh, attacks or operations or to tactically uh, coordinate. Uh, most of what you see uh, it, it launching is um, um, tar against targets of opportunity, assassination of uh, individuals who cooperate, for example, with the um, our partner force, the Syrian Democratic Forces, either on security or on local government. Um, I might talk for a minute about a couple of other primary objectives that uh, the Global Coalition is involved in. Um, of course, we cooperate with local partner forces. Um, this is how we executed the fight against ISIS on the military side, and we continue to cooperate uh, closely with the Iraqis on the Iraqi security forces and with Syrian Democratic Forces in northeastern Syria. Recently, the SDF completed uh, several uh, CT operations, for example, in Deir Zor pro province, and um, this was done in cooperation with uh, coalition forces. Um, we train and equip them, we advise and assist them, and I'm sure General uh, Grinkowicz will get involved in some of that in his um, remarks. Um, 
We continue to provide stabilization assistance, as I mentioned, to communities that have been um, liberated from ISIS. Um, this involves uh, help in uh, getting these communities um, restored in terms of their essential services so that people can go back to their homes, get back to work. Um, so it involves things like uh, providing uh, running water, um, getting uh, clean drinking water to communities, uh, repairing agricultural irrigation canals, uh, refurbishing schools, uh, hospitals, um, activities like this. The United States has been heavily involved in funding this, um, but since 2018, uh, coalition partners have also funded it uh, in the tune of uh, several hundred million dollars, both in 18 and 19, which funded a lot of stabilization programs, but also funded a lot of, of U.S. stabilization uh, programs in uh, northeastern Syria, for example. So it was a good example of uh, burden sharing in, um, in the operations. Um, the, uh, the other primary objective that I wanted to mention was um, helping what I call um, the SDF secure the uh, legacy populations, the post Bagus uh, populations um, the fighters who have been uh, put in um, prisons, uh, makeshift prisons, largely school, how, former schoolhouses, former uh, local uh, industrial compounds that have been abandoned. So these are really jerry-rigged uh, prison facilities. Um, we're working with the SDF to strengthen the physical security of these uh, prisons, um, to help them expand detention facilities for juveniles, for women, um, and, uh, and also just in general, um, help them with the uh, expansion to ease overcrowding, which is one of the triggers for violence. On the other side, we're also helping with the women and children population. Um, they were also taken from the battlefield in Bagus, um, and they've been, as Nancy mentioned, uh, put into the um, um, IDP camp at, uh, at Bagus, I mean, I'm sorry, at um, Al Hol. Um, our focus there is different. It's to provide humanitarian assistance for a very vulnerable population, food, shelter, medical uh, care. But it's also, there's a second tier to it that's very important, which is to, um, to do some of the tasks that will begin to allow for um, disengagement and reintegration, uh, the very first steps. And these are things like um, vocational training, uh, education for children, recreational activities, and uh, psychosocial support, um, which is also um, very important. Um, I wanted to mention just a couple of challenges, I think, that you asked about the, um, the um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, of course, the, the primary challenge and the thing that keeps us there is the challenge from ISIS. Um, and I've uh, developed that uh, a little bit already. What I would also talk about in the Northeast is the economic crisis that they face. Um, they've been hit very hard by the devaluation of the Syrian pound, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces and their uh, uh, affiliated uh, civilian institutions, the drop in oil prices. Um, so they're, they're having trouble uh, paying their salaries. They're having people who are ordinary people are having trouble buying um, the basic goods that they need uh, to, to survive. Um, the, the other setback that I'd mentioned, the uh, challenge is really what they faced with um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I can talk about that a little bit if you want to, but it, uh, it's been a significant challenge and uh, is likely to uh, increase uh, going forward. I'll stop there and see if you have questions. Thanks so much, Ambassador. Thanks for laying out so many of the different lines of effort and some of those primary objectives. And we'll uh, circle back to you on some of those challenges you just laid out at the end. Um, I'd like to next ask Philippa, um, it, when it comes to the displaced in Iraq, what are some of the key priorities and pressing concerns that are first and foremost in your mind today? Thank you very much, and um, it's a pleasure to be a member of, of this panel um, this, this morning or this afternoon, in my case. Um, 
Perhaps to, to, to start off with a brief comment from, from the perspective of, of UNHCR when we're talking about the displaced populations. We are, of course, focusing very much our interventions and our activities um, on civilian displaced populations. So people who have either fled ISIS or who have fled areas um, of conflict um, where, where they were previously living and who are now living either in IDP camps within Iraq or a large number of them also living in, in urban settings. Quite a lot of these people have already been through numerous um, security screenings by the authorities of, of, of Iraq, by the police, military, um, various entities in Iraq. So the presumption is very much that, that, that these people are, are, are civilians and we're therefore looking at our response as the UN as a whole and, and as UNHCR in particular as a humanitarian response to, to particularly vulnerable populations. In terms of our current priorities, um, perhaps one of the, the key, key issues for us is the question of durable solutions. How do we find solutions for these, these displaced populations so that they can either, either return, which is, has been a much talked about um, solution for the displaced populations in the context of Iraq, but also recognizing that some of these people may not be able to return to their places of origin for various reasons, which I'll come to a bit later, or may not want to return to their areas of origin. We need to also start looking at um, solutions that are, that are that other than return, and in particular local settlement in, in the areas of displacement where, where, where they currently are. Um, it's been very difficult up until recently to engage on in this discussion with, with, with the government, in particular when we're not talking about return. Return is something that is voluntary return that, is, that, that has been on the cards for a while, but these other solutions have been much more difficult to, to engage in discussions on. But with the current new government, about recognizing that it is only an interim government, but nevertheless, there is a lot of willingness and, and, and understanding that we are going to need to expand um, the, the discussion and the search for durable solutions for the IDPs beyond, beyond issues of, of just return. And of course, all these, this discussion involves a lot of, of, of complex and, and difficult issues, including the issues of social cohesion and, and reintegration of populations that may be perceived to be affiliated to ISIS, um, so that they may not necessarily be welcomed in, in, the, in the areas that they are either living in, in displacement, if they were to stay there more permanently, or in their potential areas of origin. So that's, that's, that is one, of course, um, big challenge um, for us, but it's something that we, needs to be addressed if we are really going to be serious about getting to the point where we can start talking that, about people having found a, found a solution. Um, that, I mean, certainly part of our durable solutions approach from the UNHCR perspective is very much to, to focus and prioritize protection interventions. Um, as a basis for achieving durable solutions. So here I'm talking primarily about lack of civil documentation. Many of the displaced do not have um, access to, to civil documentation. Um, also talking about preventing and responding to sexual um, and gender-based violence, SGBV. Um, addressing trauma. As we all know, many of these populations have gone through severe traumatic um, events and will need support in addressing and dealing with those events. Um, and also supporting youth through education and, of course, for everyone, access, access to healthcare. So all these are protection issues that, that as UNHCR and with our, with our partners working on these issues, we're, we're trying to address to perhaps make the path towards achieving a durable solution um, easier for, for, for the displaced. Our primary focus as well is on supporting um, the, the restitution or the giving of civil documentation to these displaced populations. And we work um, with the government of Iraq, in particular the Ministry of the Interior, very closely um, in order to assure, ensure and support them in delivering civil documentation to, to the IDPs, including through mobile missions to IDP camps um, where, they, where, where people can be registered and then, it, then 
um, receive the documentation they need. And for us, it's key because it ensures that people have freedom of movement if they're documented. It facilitates them going through security screenings that may be required if they want to go back to their places of origin. And of course, it's access, it provides access to a whole range of both basic services like health and education, but also programs that have been set up to, 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 in, to compensate people for properties or houses that they've lost, or indeed even family members that they've lost. So a whole range of, of, of compensation schemes um, require um, them to have documentation. So that's very much, um, um, our area of, of focus for the time being, but not the only one, because as this has already been said, um, key and very much also linked to the durable solution debate is the reconstruction of infrastructure. So working with other partners um, to ensure that if people are going back to, to areas um, that have been very much destroyed by conflict, um, they have access to basic services there, water, and in particular shelter. We're often hearing that one of the key obstacles to return are, is the lack of shelter. Um, perhaps just to mention a very current example at the moment, in the last couple of months, we've seen over 11,500 um, Yazidi returnees from the Duhuka area in particular into, into Sinjar. Um, and many of them are going back to, to difficult, a difficult situation and have needs for quite a lot of infrastructure rebuilding in addition to a number of, of of, of um, other needs like the documentation one, which I've, which I've just <laughs> mentioned. Um, perhaps one of the other challenges is, of course, um, the whole sort of transition point moving from what has been up until now very much a humanitarian emergency response into more longer term development, because these infrastructure projects that I'm mentioning, while some of them um, are, sh are relatively short term and can be addressed um, quite quickly, a number of sort of infrastructural programs um, link up to, to, to much more the development side of things and require input from partners and entities, including the government, of course, um, on, on, the on the development side. Um, so that has been a challenge um, for, for, for Iraq in general, um, and is certainly something that we need to continue to be, to be engaged on when we're talking about rebuilding rebuilding infrastructure. Um, just a quick word maybe on the COVID um, pandemic and the effect that that, that has had. Of course, it's, it's really been a major challenge. Um, first of all, in terms of access to populations in need, in particular the, the IDP populations, um, because there have been a number of lockdowns and restrictions on freedom of movement due to, to health concerns which makes things very difficult for the humanitarian community to provide assistance, even if there are exceptions for delivery of life-saving assistance. And perhaps even more importantly, it has meant that a number of displaced people have lost um, livelihoods opportunities that they had previously. So access to, to, to daily labor um, in, in towns and things like that have been, has been severely curtailed. And, and one of the key issues that IDPs raise with us in terms of concern is that the fact that they have lost the, the livelihoods activities that they, that they previously had. So that has been a major um, uh, challenge for, for, for them primarily, but also for all the partners who are, who are, working, who are working with them. Um, I have quite a lot more to say, but maybe I'll leave it there for now and we can come back if there are questions later. Thanks so much. Yes, I'm sure there are going to be many of them. Um, thanks for laying out some of the commitment on durable solutions and how hard it is to come by, um, particularly as you're prioritizing protection and, and the very many needs of so many of the displaced. And, and thanks for ending on some of, some of the updates regarding the COVID effect, not just on health, but on livelihoods as well. So thanks for that. Um, I'm going to turn next to General Brinkowitz. Um, you know, as many of our opening statements said, we're over a year post the territorial defeat of ISIS. So how does U.S. CENTCOM see the picture today? And how does this relate to the issues of reintegration and return of the fighters as well as the families? Hey, Leanne, thanks very much for the question. And, you know, I'd like to start by saying thanks to USIP for putting this uh, form on. Uh, it, from our perspective here at US CENTCOM, 
Uh, we, and we also serve as the Combined Forces Command for the military arm of the coalition. Uh, there's not many more important topics as we look at how we can manage this, uh, this problem of ISIS, if you will, over the long term. Um, so it is a priority for us. Uh, and much of the solution space, though, is not in the military realm, as the ambassador alluded to. Much of the solution space comes from others. So thanks to the fellow panelists that are here with me today, uh, bringing uh, a lot of attention to this issue uh, and for those who are attending. And especially good to see Ambassador Roebuck. The last time we saw each other was uh, several months ago in Syria. Uh, so I guess a couple of thoughts on, on framing the, the issues uh, here from my perspective. I did spend the last year of my life uh, in Iraq and Syria uh, as part of CJTF OIR, the Combined Joint Task Force for Inherent Resolve. And so I'm, I'm shaped by that experience when I think about uh, the problems that we face uh, and the challenges that we face with the prison population uh, and the uh, internally displaced persons camps uh, around the area. I guess I'd start by saying, and I'll focus on the prisons up front. Uh, you know, what, one of the things the ambassador highlighted that we've been trying to do both through the military uh, efforts and other, uh, other efforts is improve the conditions in the prisons uh, from a security perspective and also, I would argue, from a humanitarian perspective. And so I see that really as crucial to laying the foundation for any future reintegration efforts that would happen with that population. You know, the prison population is going to have uh, individuals within it that come from a variety of backgrounds or a variety of levels of radicalization within there. Uh, I think that there are, you know, tailored solutions for different parts of that population. Uh, and, you know, so, some of that uh, is a... Uh, is a, is a repatriation issue so that folks can be prosecuted. Some of it uh, may be repatriation uh, so that folks can be reintegrated with their, with, their, uh, with their parent societies. And so we're certainly working on all of that. But I think it's important to note that the security discussion uh, is absolutely linked to the longer term durable solutions that the team's been talking about. In the internally displaced persons camp, I'd just like to highlight one point on that. Uh, I, I, it's a really complex problem and it's not just because there are bona fide humanitarian needs in those camps. Uh, but we do have a fair amount of evidence that uh, some of the individuals in that camp, uh, especially at Al Hall, uh, are, are not just family members uh, associated with ISIS proper, but some of them are probably ISIS fighters who just happen to be female in some cases uh, and therefore weren't put into the male prison populations. And it's, it's important to note that uh, because, again, as we look at what that bell curve of attitudes looks like, uh, within Al Hall, again, we're going to need tailored solutions for each uh, part of that bell curve. So some of that is security and humanitarian conditions in the camp. Some of it is figuring out how to reintegrate uh, back with, uh, with the populations that uh, individuals came from. And as so a couple of other folks have mentioned, that sometimes that just may not be possible. I'll just close with one uh, final point, uh, and that is uh, to go back to the ambassador's point on um, messaging and, and countering the, the global message of ISIS. So you know, from the military dimension, and especially from where I sit here at uh, U.S. CENTCOM, we're focused on the security situation on the ground to allow some of these other efforts uh, to happen in terms of stabilization and longer-term durable solutions. Uh, and that's really what the military can do. The, 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 the challenge with that is if we maintain too much of a geographical focus, we forget that the long reach of ISIS ideology globally uh, can reach out and touch folks uh, who were previously radicalized and pull them back into the ISIS fold. And so it really does require a global approach from all of us uh, to counter that message. And we do have some, uh, a number of initiatives that we work within the global coalition to that end. Uh, we certainly work within the US, United States government with the State Department's Global Engagement Center. But I, it's something that we can't afford to overlook. It's not just a situation on the ground, but it's in that broader information environment that we need to address. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, General, for framing the issues, and particularly your points on the variety of different populations that exist within the prisons, that exist within the IDP camps, and, and the, the global connectivity of those who are adhering to ISIS. Um, with that, so I'd like to now turn to Azada um, and ask a little bit of an opening question on, in your book, Guest House for Young Widows, you describe the way in which many young women left for ISIS and how some different policies help push women toward some of those fateful choices. Given what you know and what you've discovered, what do you recommend today, particularly when it comes to some of the reintegration challenges? Thank you so much, um, Leanne, and, and to USIP. Um, it's very good to be here with all of you. Um, so 
I feel like, Leanne, the last time you and I saw each other, we were looking uh, at the situation in Al Hol, um, and, and not so much in a lot of ways um, has changed. Um, there has been, um, you know, a, a retrenching and, and a real reluctance in, in Europe in particular uh, and, and a set of Commonwealth countries uh, to repatriating women and children um, with ISIS affiliations in El Hol. Um, this is something um, I, I was very glad uh, to hear the uh, the general uh, Major General talk about um, separate facilities and strengthening facilities uh, for women as well as um, as well as male detention centers, because this is something that we've known has has been desperately needed. Um, there's been, uh, you know, the the problem in Europe um, is is that there has been a political blockage uh, to repatriation, um, as as I'm sure everyone is aware. Um, the language around this population has been deeply dehumanizing, uh, and publics are are very against repatriation. And politicians, elected politicians, see little uh, to gain uh, politically in, in a very febrile and still difficult atmosphere, made even more complicated uh, by COVID and, and some governments' faltering response to COVID, uh, to bring women and children back. Um, security officials who who are who are very much against this have been publicly on the record, um, just don't have. Influence on, on this policy. You know, they do make the case that it's more dangerous to leave uh, women, many of whom are um, indeed uh, ISIS fighters or, or militants, um, in, in a camp that's so porous where they could easily um, manage to traffic themselves out or to, you know, hire a smuggler to get them out. Um, there's been a, a kind of uh, a minor shift in the UK, and I think it's worth mentioning because I think it's been the real, only real development that might potentially shift course for the UK um, in, in the last month, which is that a court uh, judge that Shamima Begum, who I write about in my book, who was a 15-year-old high schooler uh, in London when she was groomed and recruited by ISIS. Um, now in El Hol, her three children have all died. Uh, she's actually in Roj, was first in El Hol. Uh, a court, uh, the, well, the British government had stripped uh, most of its uh, nationals in El Hol camp of their British citizenship. Um, but a court ruled that the government should repatriate Shamima Begum so that she could challenge the stripping of her citizenship from the from the UK, that there was no meaningful way for her to do that um, uh, from, from these camps in Northeast Syria and said very clearly, and I think this is you know why this ruling might have legs, that the security risks uh, could be managed through law enforcement measures uh, here in the UK. Uh, so this is something that I think might make, make a dent. I mean, this is very much uh, something that is uh, ruled by politicians' reluctance to um, you know provoke public ire at these kind of repatriations. Um, the number of Europeans we know in Al Hol are actually quite small, uh, even within the foreigner population of course, within the larger population of Al Hol and the whole network of camps. Um, but they have an oversized impact on uh, the perception of Al Hol and repatriation of returnees uh, in Europe. They have an oversized impact on ISIS's ability to uh, deploy the camps, the humiliation of the camps, the subjugation of these women and children in these horrible circumstances as part of um, its narrative and its rhetoric. Um, so certainly, um, potentially around Shamima Begum, the Shamima Begum ruling, there will be a possibility for some different language uh, and uh, in, in the media and in, in the public around these kinds of cases um, and extending the idea that, um, you know, she is a case, um, you know, illustrates that many of these women were kind of brainwashed teenagers, that they are not monolithic. Some are quite dangerous and some, you know, were studying for exams and buying new Congress when they were recruited uh, for largely sexual exploitation by an armed group. So hopefully Hopefully there will be some space to chip away at the public resistance that politicians sort of cultivate and then, and then um, you know, blame for their reluctance. Um, and, and there can be some movement on the real kind of Commonwealth European hard line against any repatriation. Thanks, Azada, and thanks for bringing us, you know, into the most current of developments as we see how countries are, are looking, even many countries that are all members of the coalition are all still um, looking at this at each individual case-by-case -case basis. And so it might be interesting to see if, uh, if in fact, Shamima Begin's case uh, may have some outsized impacts. Um, I realized that we already are 15 minutes before the top of the 11 o'clock hour. So um, I'm going to shift a little bit into some of the questions that we've received 
from the audience, but I'm going to ask them to all panelists. Um, I think some of them probably have about two of you that would be relevant for each question. And um, so I'm not going to direct it exactly to you, but please feel free to chime in. And so the first question that we have from the audience is, do you see a need or are there any plans for accountability or criminal prosecution at the international level for international crimes that are committed by ISIS members? Um, I'll take one crack at it and I'll let others uh, weigh in on it. Um, I think, um, at least in the first instance, our view is that uh, countries individually are better suited to try these uh, people for the crimes that they've committed. Um, uh, there's a sense that uh, if you go the route of tribunals, that um, the judicial process uh, will be lengthy. Um, the, the tribunals that have been used in the past uh, have taken quite a lot of uh, time to um, develop a verdict. Um, and I, I think at least the, the thinking right now in the U.S. government is a strong preference for um, repatriation and prosecution by individual governments. Um, I, do, um, I do take the point um, that maybe some, some thought should be given to this, but I think the general view so far at least is that um, as, as difficult as that might be, it's a, it's a more... Um, um, individualized approach than um, um, a, a, a tribunal or something international like that. Thanks. Well, great. That was a really great answer. Azada, I see you want to jump in on that too. Um, perhaps I'll just chime in. Um, uh, I, I definitely agree with Ambassador Roebuck. I mean, there seems to be little um, political appetite, especially in Europe, for an international tribunal um, in, in the northeast of Syria. Um, even this notion of, of hybrid courts in Iraq seems to have been sort of largely discarded. Um, it creates uh, all sorts of problems um, in terms of European conventions on human rights. Um, and, and it just, you know, I think the Iraqi government was disinclined um, anyway. Uh, so I think from a kind of political policy perspective, you know, there just seems that seems to be a non-starter. Um, however, I think there is sort of one element um, that would be quite important um, and that the idea of having some international response uh, could address um, perhaps uh, in a different context, uh, apart from a tribunal, is the importance of bringing uh, a much more nuanced and discerning attitude around gender in repatriation and rehabilitation and prosecution. Because we've seen in countries like Turkey and Morocco, prosecutors and judges tend to see women uh, as trailing spouses, not as militants or as operatives having this kind of uh, you know, significant battlefield or operational experience. Um, as far as we know, you know, tens of women who've been who've returned to Morocco um, haven't been prosecuted at all. Um, not only from a security perspective is, is this a really flawed approach, but it also denies women who uh, may have been victimized or traumatized um, and, and largely coerced uh, in, in joining, or you know, women on a spectrum, the opportunity to, uh, to be rehabilitated. So in Turkey, only a small handful of women, for example, uh, are in prison for their ISIS affiliation, but in prison, they have access to female religious scholars and imams and social, psych, psychosocial support and treatment. Uh, whereas you know, the hundreds who've just um, melted back into Turkish society, essentially living um, these cloistered lives uh, are not given that kind of support. Um, and that is uh, an essential part of rehabilitation. Many of them are foreigners who are living with uh, the families of, of their fighter husbands. You know, how long will that, will that be sustained? So I think bringing a, a very serious gender uh, set of considerations into the response, so all the way from prosecution um, and, and accountability through rehabilitation and DDR uh, is essential. And I think there does need to be a sort of collective effort to do that because individual states um, uh, on their own tend not to be um, bringing that into their considerations. I think that's a really important point and how to how to think of a little bit more consistent consistency and systematization across um, what are definitely going to be experiments and learning in process that many countries are dealing with 
at different points in, in the entire spectrum. So I'm going to turn to another uh, question from the audience. Um, and this one, Philippa may have some, uh, some comments on as well. Um, what do you see as some of the paths for children that were, may have been born to people of multiple nationalities and may now essentially be stateless, particularly those who may have lost their parents? Sorry. Um, actually, yes, and I wanted to come in after Azadi spoke as well on the, the need for a, for a gender uh, specific approach when, when talking about um, uh, um, reconciliation and disengagement of, of the women in our whole, but also we need to, of course, come at addressing the issues of the population in, in our whole, many of whom we all know are, are Iraqis, um, and particularly pay attention to the, to the children. I mean, we have 50 something percent of people in our whole who, who are children under the ages of, of 18 and quite a large proportion of those under the age of 12. And it would be very important when we start talking about solutions to look at, at, at the needs of those children and to avoid a situation where, first of all, we have children in, in detention or incarceration for long periods of time. Um, because that is not going to lead to a healthy outcome for those children on any front. Um, and also to look at, at, at the best interests of the child. So perhaps this is where it relates up to the, to the question that you read out. I mean, what is key is the best interests of the child. And of course, it's a difficult challenge when you have a parent who perhaps has been involved or has been affiliated to some of these, um, to, to ISIS. But nevertheless, from, from, a, from a human rights perspective, it's very key to focus on, on the best interests of that child. And of course, to take a, a differentiated approach because um, it will depend on the situation of that particular family, the activities that they may or may not have been involved in, and to look at, at education as well for those children, both at the moment while they are still in our hold, but certainly, and now I'm talking more about the Iraqi population, but certainly um, if, they, if and when they come back to, to Iraq, there needs to be a plan um, that would include making sure that those children have access to education and are able to integrate into, into the existing education systems with, with other children and are not stigmatized um, for, for their, their parents' background, let's say. That was a really great rundown as to how we can really prioritize the needs of the child in so many of these um, dire situations. Any other comments before I move to the next question? Okay, great. Um, so this is another audience question. So ISIS is merely the latest chapter in a variety of different Salafi jihadist movements that we've seen over the last couple of decades. Do you see a pathway toward defeating this movement by addressing some of the underlying grievances and poor governance that is across the CENTCOM area of responsibility? So I assume that this one would be for, uh, for the general and for the ambassador, but others, please feel free to, to join as well. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, uh, you know, we certainly understand that uh, ISIS is ju just the latest chapter. Um, there's a there's a lineage you can trace uh, ISIS back to Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, and even before that. And of course, there's other uh, extremist movements that have popped up independent of that, but that are certainly in the same uh, family of movements. And I do agree with the premise of the question that a lot of that is driven by underlying grievances uh, in the uh, in the area. I mean, this might be a uh, th this is certainly not something that the military can solve, uh, but it's certainly something that we can highlight and that we can uh, discuss with our, our partners in both the U.S. interagency and across the coalition uh, and across the international community and the, uh, the non-governmental organizations and international organizations that are out there. Because fundamentally, if you don't solve those underlying issues, uh, then you are going to get uh, these types of movements that spring up. And that's true really, regardless of the cultural context. Of course, we're focusing on US Central Command right now, but I think that would apply uh, globally as well. And we've certainly seen that in other contexts. Um, this, this is a really good place again to hammer home the impact of COVID and the challenge that that's gonna collectively give us uh, across the community as all of the nations uh, that uh, we've been talking about today from, from Europe and from North America, uh, you know, as economic conditions adjust uh, to be determined exactly what level of resources governments will be willing to apply to these problems at exactly the time when the vulnerable and fragile governments 
uh, across the Middle East and across our AOR might require additional support. So it's something to think uh, about to try to come up with a strategy for. I don't think we know the outlines of that strategy yet because we don't understand how that economic uh, um, uh, geography will lay out over time. Uh, but it, it obviously goes beyond economy. Economy is just one aspect of it, and certainly uh, governance is another. You know, I, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't say, if I take it back to the Iraqi context and the Syrian context for just a moment, um, the, one of the issues that we see is with some of the militant Shia militia groups uh, that are tied uh, back to uh, a fair amount of Iranian influence as they operate in traditionally Sunni areas across uh, Iraq. We think that that does also contribute to some sectarian tensions that historically have caused uh, the rise of ISIS. And just as, a, as an example uh, from, the, from the last while, we've, we've got a fair amount of polling data that we do to see what are some of the previously vulnerable uh, Sunni communities in, I in Iraq, how do they respond to ISIS ideology? And it, it's highly unpopular. Uh, they, they have lived under ISIS once, they don't wanna do it again. Uh, they recognize just how difficult that is. Uh, but then when a Shia militia group comes in uh, that uh, is uh, only nominally associated uh, with the Iraqi government, that's working for its own ends and the levels of corruption become clear with that, it does start to push them back in the opposite direction. And so I think some of those sectarian divides, the religious divides uh, and the governance issues that overlay on top of that are extremely important. Thank you. Uh, Leanne, just a short um, addendum to that. I agree with everything uh, the general said. I thought that was a great um, uh, response to that question. Um, just one point on, on the, the need for uh, governments for the coalition uh, and others who are involved in this problem set to address some of the underlying grievances in order to, to get to a point where we solve this um, problem of, you know, consecutive chapters of, uh, of uh, jihadi ex extremist. Um, I think it is, um, is true as, as an intellectual proposition. I just don't know if the, um, if the, the U.S. government or, or, or others are um, well positioned right now to, to do that. Um, I don't know how much appetite there is for it, um, given the, I mean, to be honest about it, uh, given um, the way that ISIS has conducted itself, it's sort of, frankly, um, poisoned that well. But I do believe that um, some of the approaches that we've talked about and some of the approaches that um, um, Azada and uh, Philippa and uh, Leanne that you mentioned um, have to do with um, durable solutions, with reintegration, with, with disengagement, with taking these first steps. Um, they can um, possibly open up uh, in, in governments and populations a willingness down the road to take a look at some of these underlying grievances and the attitudes can um, can soften and become a bit more um, uh, adaptive and nimble and in, in being realistic about the need to, to address some of these underlying grievances. Thanks. Philippa, has it anything to add? Um, I might only add very quickly, um, I think there's a, geo, you know, there's a geopolitical element to, to everything um, that we've just been discussing. I would just add very quickly, um, agreeing with both the ambassador and the general um, on, on nearly everything that they said, um, that it's quite imperative for Iran-U.S. tensions um, not to spill over more than they already have into the Iraqi theater, because the interim Iraqi government um, turning its attention to reintegration and reconciliation in a potentially serious way for the first time we've seen, um, needs to have uh, the space and the room to maneuver to focus attention on these very intractable and complex issues of domestic reintegration and reconciliation. Uh, this process is not helped by the polarization um, that's especially exacerbated and illustrated uh, in the security landscape in Iraq by Iran-US tensions. So just to sort of mention the, the looming, you know, geopolitical dinosaur uh, looming over this issue is, is that um, and and I think you know hopefully we will have um, a shift on that in, in the months to come but I think it, it cannot be resolved in a genuine way uh, given the the kind of matrix of security actors and the ways that they feed into that um, adversarial relationship that's it
Well, it seems that we are at the top of the hour and I just wanted to thank everyone for a really engaging and informative panel. I feel like we've covered in uh, just about 50 minutes or so, a huge amount of ground on an incredibly complex issue that we could definitely be uh, talking about for hour after hour after hour and still not have untied all of the different knots that are part of this problem. Um, but with that, I'm really excited to, to transition to the next part of this discussion, which I hope through a one-on-one -on -one keynote chat is going to expose even more um, some of the issues that we put on the table today. It's been my pleasure to moderate this and please thank you so much panelists for your excellent remarks, your candor, your explanations, and thanks for being part of it with us today. Great, thank you, Leanne. And let me add my thanks to the panelists. Um, it's really terrific to have that military, diplomatic, humanitarian uh, development view all together uh, to address what is without question a very complicated, uh, very difficult issue. So thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you also for all the work that you do and you have perfectly set the stage for our next discussion with General Kenneth McKenzie, who has now joined us. We're delighted to have you with us uh, this morning, sir, for this conversation. Uh, General McKenzie has been the commander for the U.S. Central Command since March of 2019. This means he's responsible for the U.S. military operations throughout the Middle East and South Asia. And uh, throughout his impressive 40-year career as a Marine, General McKenzie has served in Afghanistan, in Iraq, for the Joint Chief of Staff, as well as in dozens of other positions in the Marines and the US military. Uh, General McKenzie has been seized with this challenge of what enduring defeat of ISIS really looks like since assuming command last year. So it's my pleasure to welcome him here today. Um, we will dive into a discussion and some questions, including questions from the audience. But first, General, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And let me turn things over to you for, for some welcoming comments. Hey, Nancy, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be part of this uh, session this morning. I got to hear a little bit of the last session, which I thought was, 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 was very good. But this is very important to me. Uh, I, I tell people all the time, uh, one of the very highest priorities I have at Central Command is dealing with displaced persons and refugees. I think it's a un unfortunate byproduct of the conflict in the region. But I think unless we have a way to solve that problem, we're setting, we're, we're setting a strategic barrier for ourselves 10 or 15 years down the road as these children grow older, as they're radicalized. So I am absolutely uh, focused on this problem. And as you know, it is an indirect, we can help indirectly. We'll do everything we can to help indirectly. Uh, but I thought it was important enough for me to, to actually volunteer and very aggressively pursue this opportunity to talk this morning. Nancy, what I'd like to do if I could is just give a couple of opening comments uh, to sort of set the stage. And while I'm talking about the enduring defeat of ISIS, we should all recognize that the enduring defeat of ISIS has got to incorporate, uh, fundamental to that, it's got to incorporate a way forward for the displaced persons and all the other people that are at risk across the theater. If not, we're actually never going to really defeat ISIS and the problem is going to come back. So we just need to realize that we have to operate in many dimensions and think not only in the military dimension, but outside the military dimension as well. So I, I feel that very strongly. Uh, but what I'll do is just set a little bit of the history here. Um, so the coalition campaign began in 2014. It started with airstrikes. Uh, effort expanded to advisory forces on the ground, backed with additional air and ground fires, sustainment and intelligence support. In Iraq, ISIS pushed the Iraqi security forces to the very limits of their capabilities. Our advisory efforts with the Iraqi Army and the Counterterrorism Service, or the CTS as we know it, rebuilt their tactical capacity and began a systematic clearance of ISIS hill terrain, including the lar their largest uh, stronghold in Mosul. Iraq declared victory over ISIS in December 2017. But in fact, efforts against ISIS continue to this day across Iraq, and I'll come back to that here in a little bit. The complex operating environment of Syria proved a much harder challenge. The presence of Russian and Iranian forces, large numbers of displaced persons from the civil war, and an unorganized but increasingly desperate ISIS resistance were all obstacles to developing a coordinated campaign against the heart of the physical caliphate. 
our largest partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces, under the leadership of General Maslum, spearheaded the push down the Euphrates River Valley that broke the back of ISIS power, including the capital, the capture of their capital of Raqqa in October 2017. The five-year existence of the caliphate ended with the fall of Baguz in March 2019 in one of General Joe Votel's last actions as the CENTCOM commander. While pockets of determined fighters remain in both countries, local security forces have prevented ISIS from reorganizing into a viable threat, and certainly they don't have the ability to hold ground. U.S. and coalition forces continue to advise our security partners. We're authorized, CENTCOM also supports uh, U.S. government stability and humanitarian efforts. So looking ahead a little bit, moving forward from the territorial defeat uh, of ISIS, the campaign for the enduring defeat hinges really on three conditions. First, we need sufficient security capacity at the local and state level to prevent ISIS remnants from posing a threat to stabilization efforts and governance. Again, where authorized CENTCOM and coalition forces will support the development of operational and institutional capacity to sustain these hard won partner gains at the tactical level. Second, with security assured, national and international st stabilization efforts can focus on meeting the basic needs of the population and repairing the devastation of years of conflict. This will set conditions for the third and enduring phase, a return to the norm of institutional governance by sovereign states. This would be the conditions that would allow displaced persons to safely return and generationally impacting reforms to be put in place to prevent the resurgence of radical ideology. A little bit more about ISIS. We believe they continue to aspire to regain control of physical terrain. Without sustained pressure, they have the potential to do so in a relatively short period of time. Local security forces are the key to preventing a resurgence of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. The underlying conditions that allowed for the rise of ISIS remain, and they've been compounded by the physical destruction required to dismantle the caliphate. The amount of time and resources necessary to address these conditions is significant. COVID impacts are going to complicate, further complicate, really all other aspects of stabilization. The malign influence of Iran in both Iraq and Syria is an impediment to the enduring defeat of ISIS. Iranian support to their armed proxies in Iraq increases the risk to coalition forces, and it impacts our ability to support development of the ISF and to focus on our, the reason we're there, which is operations against ISIS. Support to the Syrian regime and regional terrorist organization prolongs the conflict, prevents the return of displaced persons and refugees and drives intervention from other regional actors. Under new Prime Minister Kadimi, the Iraqi government has an opportunity to address protesters' demands for political, economic, and security reforms. We'll continue to support the development of the ISF, transitioning from a tactical focus that enabled the defeat of ISIS to institutional capacity building to sustain the gains that they've made. There's no viable military solution to the conflict in Syria. Only a political settlement can end the violence and address the underlying conditions that fractured the country and allowed ISIS to take hold. Let me talk just a little bit about the humanitarian challenges. Russian support to the regime's Idlib offensive increased the risk of humanitarian crises in Syria. Reduction to a single crossing point in the Northwest is impacting the international community's ability to provide HA to displaced persons and the local population. Safety concerns on the part of the population very few are able to return safely to their home communities, facing either personal risks, widespread destruction, and nothing to return to, or both. Perception of safety is a far more acute problem than physical safety. The story of the vanished 104 uh, persists. Refugees from Rukban who after regime engagement were not heard from again. Syrian regime control of areas surrounding the Antaf garrison complicates the return of the population of Rukban. Both displaced persons and security partners that supported the fight against ISIS have faced forced conscription into the Syrian armed forces and, and even violent reprisals from the regime itself. The United States government is working closely with the government of Iraq to return Iraqis currently in Syria in a manner that is both safe and secure. We support the Department of State's leadership role within the U.S. government. The international community needs to support repatriation efforts or coalition uh, de-ISIS efforts may be for naught. That's the best way to solve that particular problem. The United States government supports the uniform, the informed, the safe, the voluntary, and the dignified movement of internally displaced persons within Syria. And we strongly urge all parties to work with the UN to adhere to the UN guiding principles on internal displacement. We continue to push repatriation as the priority for all the foreign persons in both camps and prisons, while allowing for civilian leadership in Northeast Syria to repatriate Syrians. 
Look, I would like to finish with just one other thing. I want to come back to how this ends because that's the title of what I was talking about. And I'm actually going to pick a phrase from one of my favorite poets, T.S. Eliot. And I'm going to say, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And that's the way this campaign is going to end. There's not going to be a significant victory celebration. There's not going to be a clear-cut military victory. The future, particularly in Syria, is not going to be bloodless or in Iraq either. But it can be, we can look to a future where security forces, local security forices, answerable to local uh, elected leadership or appointed leadership, are going to be able to handle it without extensive outside help. Uh, that's what we need to aim for. But we need to recognize it's never going to be a perfect solution that we might like and have seen in other wars. One of the key things we've also got to do is prevent connective tissue from being uh, from coming from what was once the centerpiece of the caliphate to the rest of the globe where they seek to export terror. Unfortunately, you know, that the uh, cyber issues have made it all too easy for them to uh, motivate people globally. And we've got to also fight in that domain as we go forward. So the future, uh, we, have a, we have a way forward. It's not going to be a clean cut solution, but I believe it's a solution that can be enduring uh, if we can all work together to that end. Having said that, Nancy, I'll, I'm ready to stop and answer your questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that very clear-eyed and comprehensive overview of uh, an, an amazingly complex situation. And I, I want to just go back to, you, you laid out a lot of the critical issues. Um, and since you took over the command, of course, there's been the defeat, the territorial defeat. Um, but we've also seen a, a, a withdrawal of the troop levels, reduction of the U.S. troop levels, We've seen the incursion of Turkish troops across the border. And of course, as you mentioned, we also have COVID. So I'm just wondering, how have you had to adjust your campaign and your activities um, as a result of all of these, these pretty significant changes over the last year and a half? Sure, so Nancy, we actually remain completely focused in Syria on operations against, against ISIS. That's what we focus on. That's what we work with our partner for. Now, there are several things that go underneath that that you're aware of. We reoriented last October into what we call now the Eastern Syria Security Area, which if you were to think of Syria largely as a boundary that runs along the Euphrates River to about midway north and cuts over to the, to the east a little bit. That's where we are. That's where we work with our SDF partners. Uh, and so we also, as you know, have a supplementary task to aid them in their defense of the oil fields that are in Eastern Syria, which allows them ultimately, we hope, to be able to gain income from that which they will then be able to use to help continue to prosecute the anti the, uh, the, the counter-ISIS effort. So that's really where our focus is there. Look, at the same time, we also need to recognize that Turkey has legitimate security interests. That's just a fact, and we need to realize that. Uh, we agree that the, the PKK is, has been a terrorist organization. It has attacked the Turks. Uh, we share a different view of the SDF and the, what they've been able to do for us. And we don't believe that they are one and the same. That's just a disagreement that we have with Turkey. We continue to work with them on that problem as it goes forward. But at the, the bottom of it all, the, the bottom line would be, we do recognize that Turkey has concerns about what flows over the border into metropolitan Turkey, if you will, from what goes on in Syria and other parts of, in other parts of the theater. So we need to recognize that. But we remain relentlessly focused on finishing ISIS off. At the same time, you know, I don't think we're going to be in Syria forever. I don't know how long we're going to be in Syria. That's going to be a political decision, not a military decision. It's not going to be made by a uniformed officer. So we'll be ready to respond to that. And at some point, we do want to get smaller there. I just don't know when that's going to be. I do know that as long as we remain, we're going to work very hard to finish off ISIS. And as I noted earlier, they really don't have the ability to hold ground anymore. We think that remains an aspirational goal of theirs. So constant pressure is actually very important against them as we go forward. And we work with our partners to, to ensure that pressure is maintained. It is a uniquely complex uh, operational environment. You know, the threat against our forces from Shia militant groups has caused us to put resources that we would otherwise use against ISIS to provide for our own defense. And that has lowered our ability to work effectively against them. Um, 
And we just had to do that because we've got to be able to protect our people. And those are our coalition partners that are with us in this fight. So we look, you know, but whenever we can, we look to get back to the reason that we were there. And the reason we were there is to finish the defeat of ISIS and to ensure that it cannot return to the level where it can move beyond that local sporadic violence level. Because unfortunately, as I noted in my opening remarks, I don't think we're ever going to get past that point. There's always going to be remnants of that. And unfortunately, west of the Euphrates River, in areas that we do not control, where the regime controls ground with their Russian patrons, uh, the conditions are as bad or worse than those that spawned the original rise of ISIS. So I'm not encouraged by what's happening out in the West. I think that is very concerning. We should all be very concerned about that. We have a vision for stabilization. It may be an, imper an imperfect vision, but we have a vision. I'm not sure that out in the West there's any vision at all beyond violence. Is there any coordination or common discussion with uh, the Syrian or Russian uh, forces or, or powers, uh, given that there's po probably a common goal of defeating ISIS in a more permanent way? Sure, so we deconflict with the Russians. We're carefully bounded on what we can do. Uh, we, we talk to them through a deconfliction channel. It's usually done below my level. It's done uh, at the level of my three-star commander in, uh, in Iraq in Iraq and Syria. CJTFOIR, Army Lieutenant General Pat White. He talks to his counterpart when necessary, when we need to deconflict specific operations. Uh, and then we have a more technical channel that goes between our Air Operations Center and their Air Operations Center. So we talk to them about specific things, but the talk is strictly deconfliction. It is not what I would call coordination or anything beyond that. And you know, as always, our primary uh, goal of those deconflictions is to, present, is to prevent miscalculation. When you have high speed, very sophisticated aircraft operating in a constrained space and sophisticated air defense systems, you want to prevent the occurrence of an event that could be unfortunate for everyone. So we work that very hard. And we actually have very little coordination with the government of Syria. Um, you know, I, I, it is my judgment uh, that, they, that the government of Syria has actually missed opportunities in the past to try to come to resolution with the SDF in the east. Uh, but, you know, they've never been, the government in Syria and, and Damascus has never been noted for its political adroitness or ability to accommodate change. General McKenzie, I want to pan back for just a minute because you have an extraordinarily complex command. Uh, you, not only do you address the problem that you just laid out, you also have under your command uh, the issues in Afghanistan with the Taliban and the growing focus on great power competition. Uh, today, we're talking about how ISIS really ends. So I'm just wondering, is there a struggle to maintain the focus on this issue, especially as it has morphed into not just a military solution, uh, but a humanitarian and a diplomatic requirement? Sure. That's, that's, uh, Nancy, that's a, that's a great question, because the the as I look at the theater, um, we remain focused on Iran as our central problem. Uh, this headquarters focuses on Iran, executing the deterrence activities against Iran, uh, and doing those things. At the same time, though, we're conducting a significant uh, campaign in Afghanistan where Americans are directly at risk, and we're conducting a significant campaign uh, in, in Iraq and Syria where Americans, and in both countries, our coalition partners are well, as well, are at risk. So our, our goal is always we want to keep focused on where we have U.S. service members and coalition partners and our friends where they're at physical risk. So, you know, uh, there are a lot of things that, that I worry about and, and I, as I look at my focus, but we're always tactically focused on where we have people in contact. So I would say, having said that, the, the Iraq-Syria conundrum is particularly uh, demanding because of the element of displaced persons that are there, the volume of displaced persons, the fact that we have the camps that the prior group talked about uh, so eloquently. Uh, and that is very concerning to me because again, I look at it as a tactical problem and a strategic problem. The tactical problem, we, we, is man, we're managing that. We are, we are continuing operations against ISIS. The strategic problem, though, unless we find a way to repatriate, to de-radicalize, to bring these people that are at grave risk in these camps back, preferably to their nations that they, they came from or to stay in Syria where appropriate, uh, but with some form of de-radicalization, we're buying ourselves a strategic problem 10 years down the road. 15 years down the road, uh, and we're going to do this all over again, and I would prefer to avoid that, and that is what, what I think makes the problem in particularly Syria so very complex, uh, because you've got to deal really with two timescales, the timescale of now, the military timescale, which is measured in days, weeks, hours, 
as we conduct operations. And then the longer term time scale as you know, young people grow up and, uh, and we're gonna see them again unless we can find a way to turn them in a way that will make them productive members of society. So, so let's turn to the El Ho camp. As you heard a little bit with the previous panelists, 65,000 residents of this camp, which is a small city. Um, vast majority are, are women and children. Um, you, you just mentioned the importance of repatriation. How, how have you seen the repatriation proceed thus far? How likely is it, do you think, that we'll actually be able to repatriate any significant number of these camp residents? And particularly with COVID now, so many of so, so, so much movement globally has been shut down. Um, how, how do you see the international community able to enable this kind of return and repatriation? And is the military involved with, with that? So whole we're involved purely in a supporting role with that. As you know, that's really, we, you know, we support, we, we help train the, the, the people that, uh, that provide security at the camp that work it. Uh, but we are not directly involved, in except in terms of transportation when we are asked to do that in terms of moving people. I would tell you that it's going very slow from my perspective. I think it needs to go faster. I don't have an answer besides repatriation. I mean, look, many people have been to the camp. I know a lot of people have talked about it. It's, 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 it's not a good place to live. Bad things are gonna happen if you keep a lot of people there. Bad things are gonna happen in terms of radicalization and bad things are gonna happen in terms of COVID or even before COVID, I would tell people I was worried about cholera. I was worried about access to water. We were worried mm -hmm. about a lot of uh, a lot of other things. So we absolutely support the Department of State's lead on repatriation. We think that's absolutely critical. They are working very hard, but you know, nations have got to agree to take them. Uh, and so uh, we talked a little bit about that. I heard got to hear the tail end of the prior group about that. It's concerning to me that we're moving so slowly because you know we can either we can either deal with this problem now or deal with it exponentially worse a few years down the road. And, and what worries me tactically also is the prospect of massive infection in the camp from coronavirus. Although, I, again, there are many other bad things that could happen in that camp uh, as well. So a, a significant number of those camp residents, of course, are there, there are many, many foreigners, both fighters and, and families. But there are also significant numbers who are Syrian and Iraqi. Um, you mentioned the, the issues in Iraq with both the opportunity with the new leadership there, um, the fact that most of the, the Sunni population does not support a return to ISIS. Um, but how do you see the impact and the, and the, uh, of the possible return of al Ho and other uh, ISIS-affiliated fighters and families to Iraq? Is there a willingness to take them? Do you see that there'll be uh, a downside in moving them back to what is still a very volatile situation in Iraq? Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, so, you know, it's an option of difficulties, if you will. Al Hall, arguably, is one of the worst places uh, in the world. And I've got to believe that if you get them back into Iraq, it can't be worse than that. They'll be back in there. They'll be back in the nation, the state from which they came. Um, but I'm not, I'm not wearing rose-colored glasses as I consider that possibility as well. The action of transits is going to be difficult and demanding. Settling back in an area where you may not be welcome will be difficult and demanding. But I just don't see a better solution. Uh, you know, it's, and, and my, my ability to apply levers to it is very limited because it really is a larger issue than, than us. You know, we can help the teams that go in there. We can do all kinds of things. But it really is, it's, a, it's an interconnected ecosystem of problems, if you will, that, uh, that really requires international agreement. Unfortunately, you know, there's not a, it's very difficult to gain that right now. And you're also right, Nancy, when you pointed out just a minute ago, the, the coronavirus is uniquely poised to put friction in, that, in the very thing that we think needs to happen, which is the movement to, you know, which is the movement to, uh, to the home countries. And there's 60 nations that are represented, although, the, although many of those nations have a fairly small amount of people. Uh, but I wish I had a better solution. I will tell you this, if we stay where we are, uh, we're gonna have huge problems. Huge problems in the near term, I think with lots of people potentially dying, and then huge problems in the long term, because I have yet to see a scheme that can uh, talk about de-radicalization at scale 
And I don't believe you can necessarily affect that de-radicalization, say at a place like Al Hall. You need to get people back into the environment from which they came. And I believe it needs to be a, uh, a de-radicalization process. And I've looked at a lot of alternatives and I know a lot of really smart people are working on it. But from where I sit, it needs to be embedded in the culture. So it needs to be a, it needs to be a, a Middle East solution. It needs to come from the region and would be even better if it came not only from the region, but from within the specific area that the people that have been radicalized came from. And beyond that, I am I am still struggling to find something that works because you know there may be pilot programs that can do one or two people at an extraordinary extraordinary amount of cost, but we need programs that will work at scale, um, and and I think that's much harder to to envision. Yeah, we had, um, as you may have heard, an interesting conversation on the these concepts of of disengagement and reconciliation as a key yeah. part enabling people to return. Um, and you know, I think for a lot of listeners, this whole idea of reintegrating ISIS into communities can seem like a very lofty and impossible goal. We have also seen in conflicts like the Rwandan genocide, uh, the aftermath of Khmer Rouge, that in fact, there are ways to rebuild a future that isn't only defined by its past. And um, you know, clearly this is a very complex problem, but I'm wondering if from the military's perspective, and you quite rightly point out, this is far beyond just a military problem, but in the military uh, world, are there lessons from other post environments that you think about that you pull forward to apply to this situation? You cited Rwanda. I think South Africa is, an, is another place where you can take a look at possible solutions. Uh, so yes, there are other solutions. Bosnia is another place where you can look at a solution. The only thing that concerns me about ISIS is uh, you know, it's you never want to say these, this is the worst. Um, this is the worst example of extremism that you've ever seen. But we're pretty close to it here, and so I think it's a I think it's a tall order uh, to talk about how you'd reintegrate ISIS. And I don't. And the way to do it, I believe, is not to start at the top because I don't think you can start with current leadership and hope to bend those people. You got to start at the bottom, what feeds in, which takes you to the children which takes you to the majority of people in the camps themselves. So if there's a way to work that, I think it's the way to work it. And I also agree with you, disengagement, some form of disengagement approach may be ultimately more effective, you know, than talking about de-radicalization because de-radicalization may just not be possible within the, within the fiscal and time limits that we're operating under right now. Oh. You know, one of my last trips before COVID shut us all down was to Uzbekistan. And remarkably, those the five Central Asian countries have really been in the lead in taking back uh, residents of ICE, uh, of Al Ho, mainly women and children. Um, do you have any thoughts on why there's been a greater willingness for Central Asians to take their, their citizens back versus uh, what we just heard from the panel is a, is a steep reluctance in, in Europe? Uh, you know, that's a I wish I could give more light on that. I really, I don't know. Um, smaller numbers from one thing. I mean, you know, in the case of Iraq, we're talking many, many, many thousands of people that are going to need to come back. So smaller numbers in the Central Asian states. Um, that might, if I were going to look for a causal factor, that might be the one thing. Uh, plus, you know, the, obviously it, uh, things happen to you when you, uh, when you're a good citizen internationally, Central Asian states need help. It's a good way to, it's a relatively inexpensive way to show that you're a good member of the family of nations. You're really in the, in the early spring to mid spring. Uh, the government of Iran thought they had a political error. I can tell you this, we will, and we, first of all, we will look going forward at what our presence is gonna be in Iraq. Uh, we'll be adjusted in concert with the government of Iraq. I think there's a there's going to be a requirement for us us and our NATO and our coalition partners to have a long term presence in Iraq. But I think that's something, and the level will be a, a level that will be negotiated with the uh, with the government of Iraq going forward. And I think that is a grave concern to the Iranians because that works against what they want, which is for Iraq to be pretty directly under their control and for us to be out of the theater. So good news and on that front. Now, the, the real heart of your question was what is this activity meant for us. So over the last you know, seven or eight months, we have had to devote resources to self-protection that we would otherwise devote for the counter-ISIS fight. 
and we've had to pull back. Our partners have had to pull back. At the same time, we've done some things to harden our positions to make it uh, more difficult for Iran to actually attack us in Iraq. And we've been very successful. And commanders on the ground there have done a great job. Again, Lieutenant General Pat White and his team, uh, my three-star commander there, have just done a great, uh, a great job with that. But it has had an effect. Uh, what we're coming through now is we're also seeing uh, the Iraqis are better. You would like to believe when you train someone over a period of time, eventually you don't need to be quite as closely associated with them tactically on the ground. And we're seeing the fruits of the training that we've conducted over the past several years. Uh, you know, and they're good enough to begin to fight aggressively against uh, ISIS within the physical boundaries of Iraq. And that's good enough. And uh, so that's really, you know, the fact that we're getting smaller is actually a sign of campaign progress. We don't want to maintain a huge number of you know, uh, of soldiers forever in Iraq. We want to get smaller. We want to return to a more normal security cooperation environment with Iraq as we go forward. And again, I don't know what that number is going to be because that's not going to be a military number. That's going to be a political decision that'll be made by our national leadership in concert with the government of Iraq. And the strategic dialogue that's going to occur here in the next few days is a very good sign of the healthy nature of that dialogue, which I got to tell you is nothing less than sort of a victory uh, going forward. It is not what Iran wanted. It's not how they, they saw things in January or February. Things have gone against them. And I think we can see that they will eventually respond to that. I do not know uh, what the nature of that response will be, but we will certainly be ready for it should it occur. Well, the complexity, of course, is also, as you mentioned at the top with your remarks, is that the political objectives that Iran pursues in Iraq and the, and the tactics that they employ can, in fact, inflame uh, the possibility of uh, reemergence of ISIS. So there's, there's an inherent uh, additional problem just in that regard. No, no, Nancy, you're absolutely right. You know, and I had an opportunity to meet with the, with the prime minister uh, a month ago when I, was, when I was in Iraq. And, you know, what, what they have asked us for, it, he's asked us, and I'm sure he'll continue that dialogue at a much higher level than with me when he comes to the United States, uh, is patience. They're trying to do they're they're trying to do a number of things that we agree with. We're going to have to say they'll take two steps forward. They might have to take a step back every once in a while. We need to be patient and understand that. Um, but but I think he's on the right path. I think tra the trajectory of the government is actually good. We need to give them a little space to begin to work the issues, control the paramilitary forces, all of those things. I believe he has a he has a good vision for how to proceed with that. So I think we've got a we've got a pretty good team in place there. And we just need to support him. We need to let him work. And we need to try to do everything we can to not inflame the environment in Iraq. And again, luckily, we've got very good commanders on the ground there that are very sensitive to that fact. And we work that every day. Terrific. General McKenzie, I have a stack up of questions uh, that we promised we'd get to. So uh, I go, let's go back to the COVID issue. Sure. The question is that over the last several days, we've had the first reports of COVID cases in El Ho, both with the workers and the residents, the humanitarian workers and the residents. So as you, as you indicated, this adds a new dimension of risk uh, to the children there in particular and an additional urgency for their repatriation. Uh, current counter-ISIS training equip fund guidelines allow DOD to facilitate repatriation to only country to other countries only if fighters are also repatriated. So might a COVID outbreak pressure the CTEF, the Counter ISIS Training Equip Fund, to change the rules and expedite DOD to facilitate repatriation uh, uh, from El Hall to protect the children? So in other words, to bring children back without fighters. Sure, uh, we'll certainly take a look at that. Um, that, that would not be uh, my decision, obviously. That'll be a decision at a higher level. I will tell you that you know the, the, the coronavirus emerging in the camps has been one of my fears for a long time. Frankly, I'm surprised we've gone as long as we had without it showing. And you know, so yeah. there are a couple things when it gets into the camp. First of all, as you know, it's a much younger population which is which it withstands the virus a little better. On the other hand, I don't think it's a healthy population. 
and there are gonna be a number of comorbidity factors that affect the survivability of the population. So I wouldn't, I don't draw any strength from the fact that the population's younger and typically they do better against this. So we will examine everything in concert with our Department of State partners and, and who actually has the lead in this. You know, I, we're willing, we're open to anything that, uh, that would be proposed. I got nothing specific on that. I do note it and, 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 I, and agree that that's certainly something we could take a look at. Great. Um, so the, the next question is that there are reports that ISIS members are returning to areas under Turkish control in Syria. Is the Pentagon worried about an ISIS resurgence in the Turkish controlled areas? And the SDF has accused Turkey um, of helping to smuggle ISIS individuals out of El Hol and other IDP camps. Do you agree with the SDF assessment and what's being done about that? So, as I earlier when we were talking, I think generally in west of the Euphrates River, uh, conditions are much worse than they are east of the Euphrates River, particularly with the resurgence of ISIS. I don't have any particular visibility into what's happening inside uh, Turkish controlled areas. Um, so, I wouldn't. I, I just don't know. Uh, I've got no no visibility in that. I've got better visibility actually south of there, west of the Euphrates, north of Antioch, in that area out there, the Badoa Desert and areas like that, where we where we have a little more visibility in what's happening with uh, with ISIS, and they are operating there with some limited degree of freedom, certainly more freedom than they have east of the Euphrates River. I have no evidence uh, that I'm aware of that anybody's been smuggled out of a camp in order to to, to go across. I just I haven't seen that. It's not, it's, it's not something I have visibility on. That, that's a pretty long, porous border, a lot between Syria and Iraq. Are you still seeing a lot of movement of ISIS fighters back and forth across that border? Uh, so, you know, some of, some of the um, Iraqi security forces have pushed up against it. So it's better than it used to be. Um, not as uh, back in right about the time ISIS did its final collapse in the spring of 2019. I actually believe ISIS had a very good plan in place to move people into Iraq, and I think they executed that plan. I think so. I think a lot of people came in during that time period. I think it is harder for them to execute that movement now. Of course, a lot of people are now in Iraq, so that's unfortunate. But I think the, the border is better than it used Related to. Related to that, in Northeast Syria, this is another question, there are more than 2 million Arabs under SDF control. And of course, you know, there have been tensions between the Kurdish population and the Arabs, which is just an additional complexity uh, to an already complex area. So is the USG doing anything to stabilize those areas? Do you see that Arab-Kurdish issue as, as something to, to be worried about? I am worried probably a little more about it now than I was earlier when we were fighting, when we had a common opponent uh, holding ground. That relationship is very good. Now that the common military campaign, if you will, is over and it's more of a security camp, it will require, in my judgment, considerable adroitness on the part of the SDF if they want to successfully manage, uh, manage that problem. The Iranians are also active there as well. This is, of course, a, an area that falls squarely in the mission of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, we, we know that conflicts have a lot of complexities and they happen at a large level, at a community level. And so the, the ability to get in there and, and create dialogues to bridge those kinds of divides is absolutely, absolutely critical. And that's related to uh, another question, which is, how does the global coalition move forward with reconstruction and stabilization in Syria uh, while the Russia, while Russia, the Syrian regime and Turkey all have a vested interest in undermining the SDF and SDC? So feel free to, to comment on whether you agree with the premise and unpack any acronym you Thanks, uh that's a, that's a uh, that's you know that's kind of the end state question. How do you go forward, and how do you how do you actually find a way to to bring it uh, to bring it to 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 an end to to an ending? I think that you know we are uh, we we got to do the rebuild. You, unless you're able to get money in there to rebuild the infrastructure, then nothing else is going to happen. And that needs to come from a variety of donor states. It shouldn't be necessarily just the United States that pumps that money in. There are, there are other states that have a far 
a greater interest in it than we do that are going to be more closely affected by a bad outcome than the United States. So that's not a military problem. I'm just observing that that's the way to fix, that's the way we need to get at that problem. If we can find a way, for example, to generate income for the SDF from the oil fields, if that, if that income can then be equitably distributed in the long term, uh, that's a way to actually begin to generate that. And look, I know, I've walked, I know the condition of those oil fields. They're not, they're not, uh, you know, we're not looking at, at oil fields as we would know them in Texas or even other parts of the Middle East. You know, these are generally pool surface fields that are in not very good shape. So we will work, we will aggressively support any defense support to stabilization that we can do going in there. But the money is not going to come, it's not going to come from us. It's going to have to come from other agencies, entities, in the, uh, not only in the interagency, but more particularly in the international community. Uh, and the other thing is, I think our vision would be that that wealth needs to stay there. Um, I think the Russians, on the other hand, want to extract the wealth. And so that's, a, that's an information opportunity that we have. I mean, we sort of have a vision of it where this can help fund what's going on there as well. Uh, but, but there's a closing window for that. We need to move quickly on it. The fissures that you've outlined, you know, the Arabs, uh, the Kurds, those are factors that need to be addressed sooner rather than later. Meanwhile, over time, Nancy, and now this is more of a military issue, you know, we, we expect that uh, the regime is going to want to push to the east um, because they want control of those same things. That's an economic engine. It's one of the key parts of, you know, as, as people sit in Damascus and look at trying to rebuild their economy, they think they need control of that. So we don't have a resolution to that yet. You know, our, we, we sit on the Euphrates River. Uh, and they're not going to be able to come east while we're there and while our SDF partners are there. I don't know what the long-term solution could look like there. Uh, but, you know, again, the, the, you know, the people, in, uh, the people in, uh, in Damascus have not proven particularly adroit at dealing with these complex issues. And so I don't have a lot of hope for, you know, whatever the Syrian regime might or might not bring. I know that, you know, at the political level, Ambassador Jeffrey uh, is engaged with the Russians on talking about this. So we do do outreach at the political level. Again, I'm not particularly guy to talk to about that but there is outreach that's going on as we're trying to find a way to go forward but look we need to rebuild the infrastructure we need to find some form of generation capability to provide you know, basic quality of life for these people that goes hand in hand with security i don't want to minimize or say that's an easy path forward well it, it also um has been reported uh the devastating impact of these open oil oil fields that you just mentioned on, on both the environmental and the health of the citizens in the region, uh, which is its own devastating problem. Um, but I, uh, I want to go back to the whole repatriation question because there are several that have come in. And one of them goes to this issue of partnership that you just raised, that it, it is this partnership of the international community and so the question is, how does the global coalition move forward with the vast challenge of repatriating foreign fighters when even close U.S. allies, uh, such as the U.K., and I think we could include other European allies, are so unwilling to repatriate their, their citizens? So I, I wish I had an answer to that question. I do not. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, it's the, Depart the Department of State, I know, because I, I talk to them all the time on this, is aggressively engaging on this. Um, you know, we, we've got skin in the game in Syria. Some, of our, some, not all of our partners, have skin in the game in Syria as well, and we recognize that in terms of, you know, forces that are there. Um, I think it's, but I, I just don't see any way to go forward without some form of repatriation. And that, that's a, that is a uniquely diplomatic uh, national leadership question, not really a military question. So, you know, I, I'm, I hate to sound like I'm admiring the problem, uh, but it's not within my capability to solve it. I'm happy to provide the resources to move them uh, when we're directed to do that. And I can move them anywhere in the world and move them very quickly and in a safe and transparent manner. But I think it is uniquely a political problem, but you've, but you've outlined it. It's, it's, it's hard to do when even your close allies, uh, you know, are sort of hesitant to get involved in that game. It is very it is very hard to do it as as a genuine practical matter uh, you know so but, but i think the way that we contribute actually is we buy time if we can keep the situation relatively stable then our diplomats have an opportunity to work the problem and we may be able to find a solution i can't contribute to the to that diplomatic negotiation but i can contribute 
to the idea of buying time for the diplomats to work that problem. So as I, you know, that's another reason why I'm very comfortable with our position now in Syria going ahead as we try to find a little bit of Toward justice and reconciliation. Accountability. As you know, Nancy, in some in some circumstances, when allowed by when allowed by law, we collect biometric data. We're limited on the uses of that data. We're limited on who we can collect it against. So it, that's actually a tough problem, and I don't know that I have a good answer for you in terms of being able to associate evidentiary chain with you know the people that are, then go back. And also, depending on where they're going, you got to wonder about the nature of the justice that they're going to receive in the country that they're going to. So that's an additional problem. Like I, w- I ha- wish I had a better, uh, I wish I had a better answer for you on that. I just don't have a better answer. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's not unique to this environment, but uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, it clearly compounds the problem. So um, the next question w- wants us to go back to to Turkey, um, and uh, the question is that Turkish arm armed actions in. Uh, the North have expanded in recent years, as we've discussed, but especially in the past few weeks. Are you concerned about increased friction between Iraq and Turkey? And how have Turkey's air in Iraqi Kurdistan affected the U.S. partnered missions in the region? And have has the U.S. gotten any reassurance from Turkish officials about this issue? and these actions? Sure, so clearly uh, Turkish strikes into, into Northern Iraq in, induce additional friction, they induce additional complexity into the problems that we face. Um, same time, Turkey does have, as I've said before, does have legitimate national security concerns and they're, and they're you know, and they're, they're gonna be able to, they're, they're going to address those concerns. We keep a very close dialogue with the Turks. I, you know, I talk, and as you know, all, all significant military problems occur at the junction of a map sheet or, or some other boundary. So you've got to bring another combatant commander in. So as you know, Turkey, of course, is part of European command. So I talked to General Todd Walters, my good friend and the UCOM commander, frequently about this issue. And we share, and you know, we share notes, we talk to them. So I think we have a good uh, continuing dialogue going on with the Turks. So I'm very comfortable with that level. If I need, if I need to get a message across, General Walters is very good about it, and vice versa. As they, as they, as we go back and forth across the border. Having said that, obviously, you know, when you're when you're striking targets, potential for miscalculation is very high. The potential for collateral damage is very high, and that's something that we watch very closely. General, not all our li- our v- listeners, our viewers, may understand the differences between the 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 combatant command boundaries. Do you want to just say a quick word? Sure. That? Sure. So, uh, U.S. Central Command. Um, is responsible for 20 nations in the Middle East. And Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iraq uh, are all within my area. I am a geographic combatant commander. I command a geographical part of the earth for the United States and work with our partners and allies within that area. Um, Turkey falls within the European command uh, boundary. And so that therefore the geographic boundary between Turkey and Syria is not only a boundary between those two nations, but for the United States, it's a geographic combatant command boundary. Luckily, we uh, while it's always there's always friction associated with that. Luckily, uh, UCOM and CENTCOM, the two respective combatant commands, work closely together, and it's also made easier by the fact that General Walters and I are personal friends. We talk frequently, and we share the common view of many things. So, what overcomes that kind of friction is the personal relationship between commanders, the hard works, the hard work of the staffs, and also equally important the ability to reach out to the country teams and our diplomats in each of those countries. That's also very important uh, and actually more important uh, when you actually start to think about it. So we, we use all those tools to try to minimize the sense of friction that occurs at these boundaries. So um, we talked to, in the panel earlier about the importance of non-military means being brought to bear on this issue of violent extremism. And of course, we've seen the passage last December by U.S. Congress of the Global Fragility Act, which directs uh, uh, state, USAID, and DOD to work collaboratively um, in some of these more fragile states to address the conditions that give rise to violent extremism. Uh, Do you see that as a a viable way forward? And have you seen any of that start to take hold in terms of conversations you have with 
diplomat and uh, development colleagues in the U.S. government? So, Nancy, philosophically, um, I, I, I really would like to see us move to uh, solution sets where we're not applying the military element of power as the first, as the first choice. Um, we're a very blunt instrument. We're a very effective instrument, but really, particularly in complex problem sets, it, I, I think of it, it's an arithmetic approach to an exponential problem. And there are always downstream effects when you lead with the military. We can do a lot of great things. We can go in there and fix a lot of problems initially, but never gonna be as effective as the other tools of power working because you've got to get to the root causes of those problems. We are not going to ever be good at getting to the root causes of the problems. What we can do is address the symptoms and manifestations of the problem, but the root causes of the problem require a far more delicate and nuanced approach. I'll, so let me give an example. So what just happened in Lebanon uh, is, a, uh, is an example of how we can actually help. So significant crisis when the, uh, when the ammonium nitrate blew up, what we have done is we've been in direct support of USAID and other elements of the U.S. government. You know, we've flown in plane loads of food, medicine, water, and supplies, and also some kits, uh, some medical kits. By that, I mean large medical kits capable of treating thousands and thousands of people under USAID auspices. That is an example of how we can be used to leverage the other elements of, of power. Uh, but again, what I think is it's the dime, as you know, that all the elements of power, uh, defend, uh, defend, uh, diplomatic, information, military, and economic, we're only one of those elements. And it, the, often the better way to find the long-term solution is to apply the other, other elements of power. There are some times when you can't do that. Um, and you're just going to have to go in, you're going to have to adopt a military solution because of the threat that you are presented. But at all times, I think you should seek to transition to a more holistic approach whenever you can do that. That's not easy to do, and, and but I think we're beginning to see some signs of that. And I, I welcome it. We're happy to work with it here at CENTCOM. We actually believe in that. And is, is the, um, are the conditions in and around the El Ho camp, uh, do those conditions make it more difficult given the, you know, the security situation, all the complexities that we just discussed given Turkey, Russia, the Syrian regime? Yes. I mean, so, you know, we've, we talked a lot about the situation inside the camp, which is, which is what it is. And we've, we've laid that out pretty clearly, but there are also external threats to the camp. ISIS uh, wanting to get in there uh, as well to liberate, liberate people, uh, to do things like that. Um, you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard to move around up there. The routes are generally closed all around it. So what you've got is you've got a huge um, human problem overlaid with a significant military tactical problem. And unfortunately, the history of warfare tells us when those two are juxtaposed, the military tactical problem is going to receive the majority of attention. And we work to try to minimize that because we recognize we have a unique problem there. And we want to, rec we, you know, what we don't want to do is make the problem worse at Al Hall. It's bad enough uh, mm -hmm. as it is right now. So, you know, do no harm when you can. Support the international agencies that go in there. Uh, you know, the, the last thing I would say about Al Hall is it truly is an international problem and it's going to require an international solution. No one nation, no one military can solve that problem. It does require an international approach. And I know our diplomats are working very hard to try to make that the case. General McKenzie, I want to ask you one final question. You've been very generous with your time, um, but just if you could, we've talked a lot about ISIS in Iraq and Syria. You just brought in the really terrible tragedy in Lebanon. You know, do you, just a word about your concerns about the, the actual or potential spread of ISIS through your region, uh, through it, Lebanon into Yemen and elsewhere. Where sure. do you think um, right now? What, what we're, one of the things, I, I mentioned it just very briefly early on, one of the things we wanna prevent is the development of what we call connective tissue. So originally, as a caliphate envisioned itself during their heyday, you know, the caliphate sat in the Euphrates River Valley and in Western Iraq, and then it was connected to a variety of what I would call franchise organizations, ranging from uh, the Pacific Ocean to, to the South America, uh, to Western Africa, all around the world. They envisioned those sub-caliphates as reporting back, and money would flow back and forth, fighters would move back and forth, and that was the idea of a global jihad. So the middle of that has now been taken away. 
and there, so what we want to do is prevent a globalization of the problem. Now, unfortunately, there's a degree of globalization inherent in the internet and in cyber capabilities, because you can sit any one place in the world and talk to anyone in any other place of the world. So what we, what we face now as a, uh, as a challenge is the idea of distant radicalization, the idea that inspired attacks can occur. An inspired attack is an example of someone who self-radicalizes, perhaps in the United States, perhaps in Western Europe, but through exposure to the toxic literature on the internet and decides to take up jihad and, and, and do, something, uh, do something violent there. That is very concerning to us. It's very hard to stamp out and it's made ubiquitous by the presence of the internet. But what we have been able to do is reduce the directed and enabled attacks that come from the central caliphate where they provided money or they provided other, uh, other, uh, other kinds of things. Uh, that's hard for them to do. On the other hand, you know, it is a, it is a, uh, it's a fire in the minds of men. It's a, uh, it's an idea. And so it's very hard to fight an idea within a boundary. We do think globally about this. My good friend, General Rich Clark, the commander of Special Operations Command, thinks about the global problem all the time. And we work with the global coalition to actually work against that. But it comes down to this, prevent connective tissue, create conditions where local security forces are able to contain it, recognizing that it's not gonna be bloodless. And I've said that several times because it's important to emphasize, there are gonna be eruptions, there are gonna be problems, but what we want to do is get to a place, a point where these can all be handled by local security forces, maybe with tipping and queuing from outside actors, but not significant support as we see now, you know, in what's happening in Syria or in Iraq. And I think that's sort of the way forward. But this problem is gonna be with us for a while. It is not gonna go away. It's gonna go away with a whimper. If I could go back to my T.S. Eliot illusion, uh, but it's going to be around and we just need to get used to it. General McKenzie, I'm always happy to uh, uh, end the discussion with a quote from T.S. Eliot. Thank you. You've been uh, wonderful to join us today with so much going on with an extraordinarily busy command. Thank you for your insights. Uh, thank you for your dedication in, in addressing these very complex problems. Please come back. We'd love to have an update from you uh, at some time in the future. And I want to thank all of our uh, viewers for joining us today uh, for a conversation on a very critical and complicated issue uh, that affects all of us. General, thank you. Nancy, thanks so much. The USIP does great work. I really wanted to make this. I, I protected this time. I carved it out. I wouldn't let my guys change it for me. Uh, because I wanted to do it. And I absolutely commit to coming back and giving, a, giving an update on this in the future. Thanks so much. Have a good day.